The Welsh boxer Johnny Owen is still critically ill in the California hospital after brain surgery following a knockout in his world title fight in Los Angeles. An hour ago, the hospital said he was fighting for his life and that his condition was critical. A term, says our correspondent there, which this hospital uses only when the prognosis isn't favourable. David Cass watched the fight on satellite and reports on the way Owen was knocked down three times by the world bantamweight champion Lupe Pintor of Mexico. Hello, my friends. My name is Stanley Director, and I would like to tell you about an experience I had a long time ago, which has stuck with me for these many years. And in fact, I wrote a play, which I will read you what I wrote. And the play is called The Welsh Matchstick, Johnny Owen. And it is a poetic prose tribute I might add. And let me get into it. I have a dedication. I dedicate this play to my friend Georgie Small, a professional middleweight boxing contender who I trained with in the Catskill Mountains in Smallwood, New York. I was in my late teens and a wannabe Golden Gloves champion. Georgie Small was an inspiration to me. He helped to open my eyes to the importance of a person's character rather than their physical strength. I would also like to dedicate this play to my dear friend, the renowned seven-time Emmy Award-winning actor, the one and only, the incomparable Ed Asner. He has always been an inspiration to me. Now, here are the characters. Stan, who I am, is the main and perhaps the only character in the play. So let me get right into the play. I'd like you to imagine you are in an arena with over 15,000 boisterous fans from all over the world, some inebriated. International cheers and jeers can be heard on all levels from the ground floor to the rooftop tip-tops. Here is my play-by-play of this dramatic and historic night. The Welsh matchstick came from across the sea, certainly to fight and not to flee, with hopes of winning another championship title for him in Wales, you see. Johnny Owen came to win the bantamweight title from an olive-skinned bruiser named Lupi Pintor, painter in English. Newspaper pictures show Johnny's face, pale and white, his body spindly with long ostrich legs. His virginal expression was kind of deceiving, cause he wasn't in L.A. for receiving. Oh no, he was here to slug it out, not punk it out, no. Almost undefeated, he was Mirtha Tidfield's pride and joy. His fans spent their hard-earned cash to cheer him on to victory. In the city of angels, they came from across the sea. As always, his proud father was in his corner nursing and training him throughout his fighting career. For your info, not every young prize fighter is skillful enough to whip the bejesus out of a bunch of old Blighty's best fighters. Ah, but you see, dear ringsiders, Johnny was yet an unknown in the U.S., Until now, he'd never fought anyone with Lupi's tough reputation. Lupi Pintor came from Mexico to whip the crap out of this pretty boy Lord Fauntleroy, a.k.a. Johnny. You see, cause like Johnny, Lupi needed the do-re-mi, the moolah, the dinero, like all fighters do. Pintor was not there to play. He was there to get the pay. Lupi, known for his focus, starts his prey like a life panther. I rest my case on this. Whoa, but wait. Johnny was not just some tin horn palooka who was going to let Lupi's pre-fight jive talk bug him, intimidate him. No way, Jose. You see, Owen was known for his rough and tumble ways, displays of jabs and hooks, mixing it up. Definitely not a Humpty Dumpty. Suffering a great fall, you all. Johnny never played it safe in the squared circle before, and you could be sure he wasn't going to do it tonight. Seated ringside in a dark suit, white shirt and tie, 
Yeah, a regular square was I. I heard through the grapevine this bout of fisticuffs was going to be a real rumble. Somebody was going to tumble. This ain't no Muhammad Ali in the jungle. This was the Olympic Auditorium in downtown L.A. Lots of rabble-rousers were present, none expecting to yawn tonight. Yep, that was the buzz, cuz, the take from the inside line. Wow. <laughs> yep, that's what I feel like. Wow, I said to myself silently, unconsciously mustering up strength through my parched lips, inferiority complex. I am impressed. For here I am tonight, Shazam! Me, seated beneath the ring ropes. Holy cow, if the guys in Brooklyn could only see me now. Their boy Stan the Man was making the big time, sitting there, them media dudes from all around the globe, from who the hell knows where, in suits and ties, dressed more dapper than I. And some were sleazy too. Some were dressed like the FBI. Made me wonder why. Were they looking for spies? Damn! Saw a newsman with their big old cameras snapping away. Maybe they'll catch a couple of shots of me, coast to coast, grinning like a Chessy cat. <laughs> Can you see me blushing? <laughs> Suddenly my reverie got busted again when someone yells, Hey, there's going to be a big badass fight on TV tonight. Yay! Then I heard another big bad roar. Could it have been a lion in this zoo? No! It was the crowd, I'm telling you. So, turning my noggin, I see the fighters, two dudes shuffling down to the ringside. First, Johnny Owen, the skinny malink, in a red robe, red trunks, his name blazing on the ropes, back with whales beneath. Then, Luke, in white robe and white trunks, his name on robe, too. I soon realized their weight seemed awful light. Johnny more so, feather light. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. You know what I mean, hot diggity dog. Oh, yeah, these guys are bantamweights, but can they hit? An aha moment happened. Hit me like a brick. Fireworks go off in my noodle. Don't got to let fighters wait fool you. A dynamite stick packs more in the meanwhile, and so does a firecrack in a kid's hand. Got to excuse my philosophy because it's New Yorkese, not some freaking disease. I eat cheese, if you please. How about these knees? Ask them bees. Let me tell you about me. At 16, boxing in the gym, the police athletic league. I caught a mean left hook from a flyweight. Made me shake and tremble, grumble, and almost tumble. Fell drunker than a skunk drinking a vodka martini. Why, to this day in my Brooklyn neighborhood, they still call me Canvas Back. Now, how about that? Yeah, so you know I ain't jiving when I say, bigger they are, the harder they fall. Cause it's what's writ in boxing law, you all. Now the fighters, the warriors, they've entered the ring. The crowd is chanting with terribly loud off-key voices. Hey, Luffy, Matal Vagabundo. Hey, Johnny, kill the bloomin' bum. Followed by boom, 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 boom. Like loud, big bass drums on repeat. I could have swore I felt the cracked cement floors of the old Olympic arena creaking from armies of miscreant fans rising and stomping, wanting for things to begin, for blood's sake. I was edgy and more nervous than anyone else in the joint. Why? Was it me who was going to fight? Them fans was the enemy, a bunch of Roman gawkers watching peeps thrown to the lions at the Colosseum. My stomach got tied in knots, butterflies alive in me, all taken flight, but can't get out. All kinds of fright this night. Why? I kept asking. Was it a portent of a superstitious me? Dunno. You ain't never going to see a fight in no zoo, for sure, which, if you think about it, proves animals are more civilized than we. Then Johnny came forward in the ring, nodding his head proudly to the crowd to every side of the ring. And Lupe also showed his sculpted presence in the same manner to his fans. Now the referee motions the fighters to the center of the ring. You could tell by their eyes they was ready to swing. I got a real good look. Johnny was chalky and tall, kind of bony and neat, arms like tape with steel springs, and a nose surprisingly Greek. He wasn't called Matchstick Johnny Owen for nothing. A Welshman looked like a needle standing sideways. But a tough cookie, so said my bookie. 
son. He's never been knocked off his feet. He's going to be pretty damn tough to beat. Now, this other guy looks like a bull. What's his name? Pinta. Yeah. Wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. No way. Loopy Pinta was sizably shorter, but much broader compared to the warrior who looked like a needle. Pintor, athletically trim, olive skin, handsome, shoulders of a fullback, eyes, hot coals of fury. And the way he held his big mitts, I said, he looks like he can give you the blitz without playing tricks. Impatiently fidgeting, they did wait, listening to the ref's instructions like a couple of racehorses waiting to get out of the gate. Pampered by trainers massaging their necks, there was like a couple of newborn babes in swatty skivvies. The referee's ramble could be heard all over the joint, even the gents' room, loud and clear, even catch it where you bought your beer. He repeated the familiar phrases. Want a good, clean fight. Break when I say break. Protect yourselves at all times. No rabbit punches can cost you the round. Now, come on, boys. Let's give them one hell of a fight. Back to their corners they went for silent prayer and for destiny's bell to toll. Lupe, the Mexican champion, makes the sign of the cross with lightning speed. I thought I saw the champ from Wales bow his head too. A holy right in everyone's sight. Indian braves on the warpath, naked from the chest up. Two of the best. Must be heaven blessed. The samurai marching into battle bravely. Never gravely. Accompanying music was the bell as the roaring crowd began to swell. While Mariachi played off in the distance, I took a quick sip of my beer. They charged at each other, punching away. Johnny Owen was throwing jabs quick and fast. Loopy battled back. This was business. Where were the chariots? The fighters knew they were not there for a fling cause. Fancy footwork and bluffs was goddamn rare with their brand of fisticuffs. Action Jackson and championship fame. Purses to be claimed. That was all part of this game. Loopy kept punching away, landing more than a few. Johnny likewise. These guys were there to slay, not to play. Throwing punches and bunches like pistons, plunging away. Ramrods were thrown. Bam, bam, bam. Leather smashing on bone. Oh my God, I cried out. It looked like these guys were made of stone. But round after round, the night got darker and darker. Loopy Jeb left some rights, countering towards Johnny's head and swung to his gut too. But then Johnny got Loopy against the rope, swinging away. This was action through and through. Loopy didn't use no rope-a-dope, but got away as the rounds came and went. Father time was ticking away. I thought I heard the TV guy say, looks like Johnny's winning this fight straight away. The Welshman was making a damn good show of his fisticuffs. But then again, I could have been wrong. It could have been the other way around, you know, with all that noise. Fighters battled away, snorting, sniffing, grunting, and punching. Whoa! They certainly were hitting hard. Loopy throws a left uppercut to Johnny's gut, followed by a right. Unfazed, Johnny keeps moving in closer, getting his lumps and not dancing away. Glad I wasn't in his shoes. I could see Loopy was looking to connect with a right to the chin, and you could tell he was pretty bright in this game, but his brawn took center stage, if you ask me. Johnny, the more classical boxer, jabbed away, throwing lefts, then rights, stinging his prey. A classy fighter, I heard people say. He definitely appeared stronger than he looked, like a praying mantis, distinctive posture. A good left, he got to Loopy's chin, but not a respect from him. Conversely, Loopy was bullish, aggressively mixing it up. He kept sending Johnny the message. Yes, he was the bull, but not in a china shop. Loopy knew what he wanted and had a direction. Mass destruction. With each round, he kept coming, slugging like mad. Left hooks, right crosses, shots to Johnny's head, bombs to the belly, round after round. Loopy's sole goal was to knock Johnny out in a hurry. Punishing and bruising, a couple of drunks said bruising. Short night. Give up the fright. All the while, Welshmen and Latinos cheered their bambinos. The spirit of the arena grew meaner and meaner. Christian, lion, Turk, and Greek 
all those things not meant for the meek. Johnny's pale face turned crimson and gray. This was turning out to be a hell of a day. With mouse on eye swelling, Loopy kept getting tagged. That made him real mad. For this gringo knew his ring lingo and continued real bad. As they say in the streets, bad is bad. Johnny Owen was a handful, throwing lefts and rights. Loopy never wanted to disappoint, aimed to knock out his lights. Wow, Loopy landed a right, grazing Johnny's chin. His lethal arsenal was in play today. In between rounds, handlers became priests, sprinkling water on brows, ministering moves to avoid defeat. My God, you would have thought the Holy Ghost was there. Round six, a crowd member got their kicks, setting off firecrackers to add to the mix. Were those rifle shots? LAPD stood proud, but the culprit got lost in the crowd. The TV guys in the crowd were getting lessons on the sweet science. Newspaper men called it the art of prize fighting. British sports writer Pierce Egan, way back in 1813, called it so, as did A.J. Liebling. But Jimmy Cannon called boxing the red light district of sports. The fight was going smartly, Johnny taking blows but giving them too. He was holding his own. Oh, there was a good shot. He landed on Loopy's chin. Gee, maybe Johnny's going to whip his tail, pull an upset. But Loopy's still standing, brawling away. Arthur Ringtime favored Pinter four to one, but Owen's fighting like a man possessed, throwing leather like mad. Yeah, sure, going to make him Welsh folks proud. I figured, yeah, if Johnny whips him good, I heard. I mean, he trained doing nine miles a day of road work even when not preparing for a fight, just for the hell of it. Boy, oh boy, that's a lot of running. Ooh, I got tired just thinking of it. Hot dog. Johnny throws an unanswered left and a right. Whoops, Loopy comes back with a shot to his liver. Then Johnny, full of energy, throws a flurry of punches like mad. <sighs> but Loopy lands a punch to Owen's kidneys. He's still standing. How about that? Loopy smiled kind of macho. Threw a little wild. This guy from Wales was as good as the tails. What did it take to make him a piece of cake? A good old haymaker to the jaw, hombre. A bantamweight championship was at stake. Round after round, undeterred, Johnny keeps throwing leather with those eight-ounce gloves. Loopy's face is getting peppered by Johnny's relentless strikes, blood around his eyes and nose. Then, when in close contact with Owen, boom, gesturing to the referee like he was fouled by a headbutt. However, ref doesn't penalize. Loopy then keeps driving himself relentlessly forward like a Sherman tank, looking to mow down anything in his way. The bell rings, ending the eighth round. I heard someone yell to the bookie, Owen's ahead by a couple of points. My stomach began to feel queasy when the ninth round began. Yeah, I was starting to feel kind of sad. Because now there was no oomph to Johnny's blows. He sure was throwing plenty of them, but wasn't a damn feather trying to hit a brick wall. Wow. Now Johnny fooled me by attacking Loopy with a volley of direct blows to his kisser. I, I thought maybe he could cause damage by a sheer pounding, wearing Loopy out. Yes, Johnny's on his way to pull an upset. Yikes. Then, suddenly out of the blue, Loopy lunged throwing a thunderous right that made Johnny go to the canvas. But Johnny bounced back to his feet. The ref did the count and sent Loopy back to the corner. Johnny shook it off, bleeding from nose and mouth. He nodded to the ref that he was still raring to go. Did that one punch turn the fight around? He returned to battle, putting up his dukes in the final 14 seconds of the ninth round. The bell tolled. Quickly, Johnny's cornerman ensued, escorting him to his stool. The boy from Wales looked kind of dazed, sitting, staring blankly, crimson drops dripping from eyes and nose, looking harmless. Or was it a pose? Sure, Johnny could be playing possum. Loopy's going to think he's hurt real bad, huh? But when the round begins and he moves in, he's in for a BAM! Because Johnny caught him in his web. Like the spider got the fly and now he's going to put him to bed. Ending this fight of dread. 
Wishful thinking is a fancy, not meant for moments of peril. Meantime, Johnny's handler is feverishly working on him, hoping to heal his wounds. The cut man stopped the bleeding. The trainer applied ice. His father whispered support. But somehow I felt a tinge of scorn when the raucous crowd cried out for more blood. They were hungry to see this bull destroy a brave matador in the ring. Thoughts of Hemingway's death in the afternoon sailed into my brain. The human family is supposed to care for one another, but where was our creator amongst these Romans? Doesn't the human heart incline itself to cringe at such carnage? Instead, I resorted to a callous approach. If maybe a sudden surge of strength would return to Johnny. Yes, a Samson moment would ensue. This has happened in boxing before. That is Joe Lewis knocking out Max Schmeling in their return matches first round. Boom! Lewis was seeking revenge for his first fight with Max by getting knocked out in the 12th round. Lewis got his sweet revenge. Yes, now I was rooting wholly for the underdog. The 9th, 10th, and 11th rounds came and went. Whoosh! Johnny was still throwing leather and mixing it up, vying for a championship world title for a place in pugilistic history. But where was his Samson? The bell tolled ominously for round 12 of this 15 round championship bout. I faintly heard it through the roars of the rambunctious crowd. Johnny did the sign of the cross with enlightening speed, came out aggressively, courageously swinging at Luffy, trying to force him into the ropes to get the advantage. Yet, it struck me that Luffy and he were in a choreographed dance, nimbly partnered. Oh no, my senses got back to me. For goodness sakes, this wasn't the Joffrey Ballet's Nutcracker Suite. Two macho warriors. Luffy counted quickly with a barrage of blows, battling away from being stuck against velvet ropes. He forged forward, paying no mind to Johnny's combative bombardment. Johnny, no quitter, flying hearted in a squared circle, throwing leather at the Iron Man and getting hammered by blows which seemed to come from nowhere. Johnny and Luffy were giving fans more than their blood's money worth. Then in the midst of the 12th round, in the blink of an eye, Luffy's thunderous two-fisted attack knocked Johnny to the canvas. This was the second time Johnny had ever been knocked down, and all of it by Luffy's doing. Johnny got to his knees, and you could see he wasn't pleased. Getting up before the count of eight, he was ready to fight the bull, assassinate. You know, this was L.A., and for Johnny, it was the biggest payday. You see, TV and the press were here all night for the play-by-play. Blow by blow sands the infamous Mr. Howard Cosell. Chalky Johnny was no slouch. He sure didn't fight out of a crouch. Valiantly tall and brave he stood, like some giant oak wood. He went banging away with all of his might, so he could just stay, stay in the fight. Johnny boy, someone hollered from the crowd. Another couple of lefts and rights, you'll have him dancing on a cloud. Luffy landed another devastating right, exploding on Johnny's face and like a child's broken toy, Johnny Owen silently crumbled to the canvas. In a split second, the ref gestured, stopping the fight. The hungry crowd wanted more. Boos and hisses rained the floor. Johnny at first lay motionless. Then his arms flailed like a fish out of water. Johnny's people sprang into the ring. This wasn't supposed to be. They looked down at their boy in shock. How could this happen to someone who was a rock? A tough cookie, repeated my bookie. But he got the daylights knocked out of him. Johnny was a humble kid. Never a gal in his life, except his mom, they say. No gal for Johnny to marry and have kids with. He would never have that again in this world, you see. Wait. Then I said, maybe that won't happen. Owen will wake up and fight again. Sure, there's payback in the ring. I still stubbornly believe Swedish boxer Ingemar Johansson hammered champion Floyd Patterson to the canvas seven times throughout their fight 
and took away a bleeding and reeling Patterson's heavyweight championship title. Ah, uh, uh, but friends, but friends, dig this. Patterson turned the tables a year later and knocked the double out of Johansson to become the first former heavyweight champion to regain his title. Yay! Maybe it'll happen again. Miracles! In the ring, urine was tossed Johnny's way. Lots of booing. Doctors came with oxygen. They all tried to get Owen to wake up. The Beatles, let it be, Mother Mary, sailed into my head. Reality check. Nope, he was not moving. Could this be the end of the fight and Johnny too? Horrified sorrow spread from the auditorium to Wales while the hero was rushed to the hospital. Buried in Wales, probably telling tales. But to me, Johnny Owen was a champion shrew. And I'll never forget that night too. Made me feel lost. A piece of my heart gone. Hell, he was someone I could have shot the breeze with, having a beer with, shooting a game of pool with, or just a dude saying hello to. Johnny Owen died after seven weeks in the hospital, never to regain consciousness. The doctors recommended pulling the plug because he was brain dead. Johnny's father, Dick, consented, along with his mother, Edith, who's flown in from the United Kingdom to be with her son. Years later, as was written in the press, Dick Owen visited Lupe Pintor in Mexico to make peace with himself and with Lupe. Now, dear audience, just as the last heroic Prince of Wales, Owen Glinder is commemorated with his own statue, so is Johnny Owen in St. Tidville Square, the Ulch. <laughs>